When I was growing up, being a fan of a science fiction franchise was not exactly encouraged by the status quo. Star Trek, Doctor Who, Godzilla movies, Six Million Dollar Man, whatever it was, embracing and celebrating your affection for any TV show or movie that wasn't a West Western or a police show or something like that brought you nothing but ridicule and concerned looks from your parents and teachers. I was actually one of those kids whose parents or grandparents would actually take away our memor memorabilia and throw it in the trash like it was a rancid Thanksgiving turkey carcass in January. Just, just to try to curb us of our aberrant behavior. Ugh. Thankfully these days, the fandom community is far more mainstream and encouraged. So much so that there are actually industries set up to enable cosplay and prop play to a previously unprecedented degree. There are also fans who are now actually getting industry recognition for making what's called fan films because they've poured so much time, money, and effort into attaining near professional grade production values and script quality. One fandom in particular, in particular, sorry, has gotten an especially huge boost in recent years in quality. That fandom, my friends, is Star Trek. The one that started me on my path towards geekitude 49 years ago. Nava odo bakka rancha e sume akala. And welcome to Adam's Film Rants, the only YouTube movie review show that feels like it's stranded in the Delta Quadrant. I'm your host, E. Adam Thomas, and tonight we're looking at a special group of films, Star Trek fan films. Now, we're, look we're not just looking at three individual films, mind you, but two fan series and one film made by fans of and from Star Trek. We'll start chronologically with the earliest entry, Star Trek New Voyages, also known as Phase 2, created and produced by James Cawley, who for the first few episodes also played Captain Kirk. New Voyages started in 2004 with a pilot episode entitled Come What May, a kind of uneven affair which suffered from some rather corny writing a triangular Borg-like ship, and a mischievous female antagonist who came off more like a weird cross between a hippie and a drunk hipster chick than any kind of actual threat or savior. Now the bridge set is awesome and the CGI effects look pretty damn good as well, but the story and the corny, overly referential uh, dialogue is a fucking mess. This fact was not lost on Cawley, as he pl himself pretty much outright dismissed this episode from his series canon. Now in the second episode, In Harm's Way, that significantly raised the bar, functioning both as a sequel and a prequel to the classic Star Trek episode, The Doomsday Machine. Hello there. Commodore Decker. Yes. He made this two years ago. He died eight months later. Commodore Matthew Decker, this is my report. If you're watching this tape, it means someone from Starfleet has come looking for me. I'm betting it's Jim Kirk. But whoever it is, I'm sorry I missed seeing. The episode also features a guest appearance by William Wyndham, reprising his role as Commodore Matt Decker. The effects, writing, and acting are all significantly improved, although the deus ex machina at the end of the episode does come off as a bit self-indulgent. Now, that's not an altogether fair knock against Cawley and company, because let's face it, Making a fan film is a gloriously self-indulgent exercise. 
It's being done for the love of a show you love and to feel in some small way like you're actually part of it. James Cawley's version of Star Trek has gotten so proficient at celebrating Star Trek that he's attracted cast members, crew, writers, and other people from the original series and the newer series to appear in or participate with the series. Walter Koenig, George Takei, Grace Lee Whitney all reprise their roles in the films, and they also attracted man many other Trek and sci-fi stars, including Gil Gerard of Buck Rogers fame and Mal Malachi Throne. Each episode has gotten progressively better and more interesting, and they've been able to tackle a couple of topics that, back in the day, would have gotten the series shit-canned faster than, ex than an exploding warp core. Gay marriage, eugenics, Elvis hair, no topic is too sensitive, and they don't have a bunch of puritanical fuckheads telling them what they can or cannot do. That's also why I enjoy doing this show, by the way, so I can say things like fuck you up the ass with a termite-covered dildo till your bunghole drips shit down your whore mother's face without getting bleeped by some fucking douche-nozzle network censor who hasn't been intimate with a member of their preferred gender since Nixon was in office. You know, like ang Angry Andy. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look at the Rantometer number one for Star Trek Phase 2. Artistic gets a four, because not only have they nearly flawlessly recreated the sets from the original Star Trek series, but for the most part, their other sets and ingenuity in general and creating a believable visual aesthetic works beautifully. Coolness gets a five, because as the series has gone along, they've not only had some really awesome storylines, but some genuine emotional moments as well. Originality gets a three and a half, because even though they are recreating something that's been done before, they have taken some in intriguing twists on a Star Trek storytelling, more often than not making some episodes better than anything you might have actually seen on classic Star Trek or even some of the subsequent series. Suckitude does get a one. Mainly because when they do indulge in a bit of geeky referentialism, it's more often than not a bit too cringeworthy. That gives James Cawley's Star Trek New Voyages slash Phase 2 a total score of 11.5. <coughs> Certainly, one of the most amazing Trek fan franchises in fan film history. Say that three times fast without spitting on yourself. Anyway, next on our roster is the 2007 feature-length production Star Trek of Gods and Men. Directed by Tim Russ, Tuvok of Voyager fame, this film takes place 12 years after Kirk supposedly dies saving the Enterprise B in the Nexus from Star Trek Generations. Starring Nichelle Nichols, Walter Koenig, Tim Russ, and Alan Ruck, the film largely takes place in an alternate universe where Kirk was never born, and the Federation has devolved into a warlike empire of tyranny and terror. This is supposedly a more professional production, and they utilize the resources and some of the cast from James Cawley's films, but this produ production is surprisingly less polished more uneven, and honestly, not as well acted. The effects are okay, although in some sequences the frame rate of the CGI scenes looks fairly stilted, like an old Hanna-Barbera animated cartoon from the 1970s. The story itself is not too bad, and there's some really intriguing moments, but it is surprising that a film made by industry professionals, despite its non-profit fan film status, actually comes off looking weaker than an actual fan film put together by supposed novice filmmakers. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad fan film. Trust me, I have seen plenty of those. What I am saying is that considering the people involved in its production, it is a bit disappointing. Then again, just because someone works on a series for several years, that doesn't mean that they know how to make a film. Look at Star Trek V. Shatner directed that film, and it was awful. It wasn't all his fault, mind you, but it just goes to show that just because you played Captain Kirk 
doesn't necessarily mean you know how to fly the Enterprise from behind the scenes. I think my biggest issue with with this film is the way the whole storyline seems to be a huge contrivance of references from classic Trek. Charlie X kidnaps Uhura Chekhov and Captain Harriman, the latter two of which he's never even met, and takes them to the Gateway Planet from City on the Edge of Forever. Makes them watch as he goes back in time to kill Kirk's mom while she's pregnant with him. Yada, yada, yada. War, death, destructions, life, love, death, and madness. Everybody but Tuvok and Uhura being nasty buttheads. Basically, it's just not handled as well as we could have hoped. Charlie, you took over the ship. He should have helped me. Captain Kirk's responsibility was to his ship and crew. Wait. You don't know what that structure can do. Oh, but I do. What happened? He has passed into what was. All that you knew has been altered. Has been altered. That's a problem anytime someone from a popular franchise gets involved with films to make a, with fans to make a film of their own. The bar of ex expectation is both regrettably and understandably raised unbelievably high. If New Voyages or the other series I'll be mentioning next had sucked really bad <coughs> with cheesy sets and bad acting and so forth, then this probably would be getting a much better review. But when fan-made productions outshine the efforts by the actual stars and people involved with the show, it has a tendency to amplify the flaws quite a bit. I know it's unfair, all right? But fuck it, everything is unfair. Hell, I think it's unfair that you have to pay an installation fee for cable TV even if you're the motherfucker who had to do all the work. It's unfair that the Dr. Pepper is out at the fountain at Circle K down the road. It's unfair that Ghostbusters fans are all acting like a bunch of misogynistic, whiny-ass fucking douchebags because, ew, the new Ghostbusters movie has chicks in it. Ah! Fuck you, you fucking fucks. Anyway. Admittedly, I am being a little bit hard on of gods and men, but to be honest, I really did expect much better. The Rantometer for Star Trek of Gods and Men shows Artistic getting a 3, Coolness gets a 3, mainly because as good as Nichols and Koenig are, it's not enough to save the production as a whole. Originality gets a 3.5, and, and because the visual effects are really kind of disappointing, Suckitude gets a 2 giving of Gods and Men a total score of 7.5. Finally, we reach the third entry on this special episode. Star Trek continues. The brainchild of Vic McNogna, who plays Captain James T. Kirk. Now, while the idea behind New Voyages and Phase Slash Phase 2 is to bring to life what might have been if Paramount's 1970s version of the series Phase 2 had actually gone into production instead of being mothballed in favor of motion, a motion picture franchise, Star Trek Continues more or less picks up directly where the original series left off as if NBC had given Star Trek a fourth season in its original run. To date, there have been four episodes produced, three of which are very referential to previous uh, original series episodes. Now, to be honest, I can't fault Vic's series on this note without stating that James Colley's series is to a degree equally culpable. Even the Phase 2 episodes that don't directly re reference previous Star Trek episodes do instead adapt scripts that were originally either rejected from the original series or had been rough drafted for Paramount's Phase 2 project before they switched gears to, to cinematic presentation. Where I do find a bit of fault in continues 
is the fact that they're not doing a whole lot to beautify the visual effects. Most of the shots of the Enterprise, while being beautifully rendered, are almost direct duplicates of the angles and stock shots done of the Enterprise from the original series. They have done an awesome job at recreating the sets and the look of TOS, but then so did Cauley. Both Cauley and Mignogna, as James T. Kirk, are effective in their roles, although both have been guilty of shattering it up a bit at times. Mr. Flint, the android girl, Reyna. You remember her? I remember everything. Everything. Not my finest hour. You were in great turmoil after those events, Captain. I acted in a manner in which I felt would spare you pain. Perhaps upon reflection, it was not my place to do so. She was, however, simply a machine. She was human. Whatever she started out as, she was human when we... when I pushed her too far. However, the main downfall of Continues is the pacing. A lot, it's a lot more uneven than Collie's Trek. Story will start moving at warp 9, then suddenly, inexplicably, drop out of warp like a hamster ball rolling down a flight of stairs into a kiddie pool full of grape jello. Don't ask me where that visual metaphor came from. <laughs> it's been a long weekend. Anyway, Continues does feature a couple of awesome casting choices as members of the original crew. First, Chris Duhan does his father proud, playing Scotty, the Enterprise chief engineer. When he's on screen, you kind of sometimes almost have to blink and remind yourself that this isn't James Duhan. His voice and mannerisms are pretty much right dead on, except that he's got all ten fingers. Also, Grant Imahara, of Mythbusters fame, plays Lieutenant H Hikaru Suru. Oh, bye. Now, in the first episode, he does kind of overdo the George Takei impression a bit much. But in more recent episodes, he's done a much better job of making the character more his own. And he's, he's not a professional actor. He's, you know, a Mythbuster. So... Now, I, th I know that sounds a bit contradictory compared to my comments about Chris Duhan, but the fact is, Imahara's Takei impression was not very good. He's way better off making his own stamp on the character. Look, it's a fan film, yes, but an actor who is taking on an iconic role has a responsibility. If you're going to play Captain Kirk, Spock, or any of the others as the actor who originally portrayed them, then you pretty much better be able to pull it off perfectly, note for note, or it's going to come off as an embarrassing, unintentional parody. If you can't be Shatner, Nimoy, Duhan, or Takei, then be the character. Be Kirk, not Shatner. Be Spock, not Nimoy. As much as I blasted J.J. Abrams' Trek franchise a year ago, I have to give mad props to Chris Pine for making his own stamp on the role of James T. Kirk. Vic is pretty good at being his own Kirk to a degree, but he also sometimes slips into some awkward Shatnerisms. Oh, and I just real so realized something. I haven't cursed in a few minutes. Guess I didn't have to. Star Trek Continues is not bad at all. It's not quite as good, in my personal opinion, as Collie's Phase 2, but it's pretty fucking close. There you go. And all three productions I've mentioned tonight are a hell of a lot more enjoyable than most of Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> Fuck you, Rick Berman. Anyway, on the Star Trek Continues Rantometer, Artistic gets a 4. Coolness gets a 4. Originality gets a three. And sadly, because of some of the story writing, because some of the story writing is a bit weak and unbalanced, Sucka 2 does get a one. Star Trek Continues gets a total score of 10. This brings me to one more point. I picked these three productions because even though they're considered fan films, 
All three are a high watermark, being produced, written, directed, and acted largely by people who have performed these roles in filmmaking before professionally, many of whom have worked on the Star Trek franchise directly. I could have picked more genuine fan films, but to evaluate a bunch of guys who work in the same call center who do their fan films against a green screen in their mom's basement is, is about as fair as holding a teenage garage band to the same standard as Pink Floyd. You can't fucking do that and maintain any re realistic semblance of credibility. To do so makes you a fucking asshole, and I'm the chief asshole around here. Oh. And a quick note to you Doctor Who fans out there, could you please talk to the guys who are doing Devious, talk them into finishing editing, editing the goddamn thing already? I've been waiting for that fucking movie since I first heard about it in about 2001. Seriously guys, you've been working on this thing since 1991, let's see it already! What the devil's going on with that thing? This guy is picking something up. Well maybe it's the TARDIS. Or something less hospitable, perhaps. That's it, Doctor. Always the optimist. <laughs> when you've been travelling as long as I have, you get an ear for this sort of thing. Those too, by the looks of it. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyway, coming in October, we'll be doing another All Request Month. I want you to tell me what truly mind-fuckingly horrific films you want to see me review. I want to know what really gruesome, mentally scarring, nightmare-inducing movies are your favorite and why they clusterfuck your psyche three ways into shitville. I'll pick the winners at random and read your comments on the show before I present the rant. Comment on this video here on YouTube, message me on Facebook, or even email me at filmrantseat at cox.net. In the meantime, Kapla, folks. Angry Men Reviews. Many fucks said, no fucks given. Fuck them, kill them, and eat them, boys. Go ahead.